السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکم سی ٹو لیکچر نمبر تھرٹی ٹو آف مارکیٹنگ فار نان پرافٹس ایم کے ٹی سیون ٹو ایٹ ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان دی کمپوننٹ آف لرننگ از گوئنگ ٹو بی پلاننگ اینڈ آرگنائزنگ انڈیویجول گیونگ دا ریزن دس ہیز بین ٹیکن ایز اے سیپریٹ سیگمنٹ آف لرننگ از دیٹ انڈیویجول گیونگ فارمس اے ڈومیننٹ پارٹ آف فنڈ ریزنگ فار نان پرافٹس We know that okay, we can generate funds through foundations of different kinds, like individual foundations, corporate foundations, independent foundations, and so on and so forth. And uh, we also have individuals who are okay, willing to donate um, toward the NPO's cause and uh, okay, make their contributions. And knowing that uh, almost 70 to 80 percent of uh, total fundraising is done through individuals, Therefore, it has to be an organized effort. It has to be an effort which is systematic and has to be put in place by individuals who are very knowledgeable about the organization, its internal as well as external environment, and part of the external environment is the donors. We have different kinds of donors. You know that we have small donors, medium-sized donors, and big donors. So therefore, the question of reaching all these donors uh, becomes very important because it takes us into the uh, segmentation exercise. So in other words, people who are responsible for uh, organizing campaigns could have to be high ups in the organization. As a matter of fact, the person responsible for uh, this kind of campaigning or campaign planning should not be a person less than uh, the stature of uh, the marketing manager. This the person could also be the chief executive of the organization, but depending on the structure of the organization and the size of the organization, it has to be one of these two uh, people um, who should uh, steer uh, this planning process and then organize it for very effective execution. It's not just uh, the segmentation. This person also has to be a good leader because uh, he's supposed to or she's supposed to motivate uh, the people into uh, the working for the organization in terms of fundraising. It is um, a team of um, regular staff members as well as uh, the volunteers uh, who work for uh, this particular cause, i.e. fundraising, collecting donations. And before the, they can collect donations, of course, they have to solicit donations. And solicitation is an art. So in other words, if we have regular staff on the one hand, we also have volunteers because don't forget that we are talking about nonprofits and nonprofits are not always fully staffed the way their commercial counterparts are for the simple reason that they are always in need of funds. So there has to be a team of volunteers And uh, in collaboration with um, regular staff members, all these people who form one joint team with the work for the cause, the meaning generating funds for the cause. The person responsible for campaign planning has to be smart enough to establish what kind of team structure is going to be effective for this particular fundraising project or fundraising campaign. In other words, It has to have uh, a very clear idea of the number of people who are going to be from the regular staff side and the number of volunteers who would be working for the fundraising project. And given this, the person has to have a lot of uh, traits that a typical leader in any organization should have. And toward that, the person should be considering questions like uh, what is going to be 
the segmentation when it comes to donors and uh, collecting donations. It is the segmental boundaries which uh, are going to make it uh, very clear for the organization uh, what kind of teams should be getting in contact with what kinds of segments because uh, the segments have their own profiles and uh, by the same token, regular staff members or for that matter volunteers could have their profiles. So it is the job of the leadership to look into things like uh, the match between the different segments, different uh, solicitors, uh, whether they are regular staff members or volunteers could have to come into contact with. This interaction has to be made very positive. At the same time, the leaders also uh, must uh, draw a very uh, clear line between regular staff members and volunteers in terms of execution of their duties. Well, it goes without saying that they all have to perform the same duties, but then uh, the leadership has to um, carve out a very well put together uh, training program for uh, the volunteers in order for them to be in the mainstream of the working. These people have got to be very clear about the goals of the charity organization as well as about the, the makeup of uh, different segments or in particular that segment with which a certain group of people are going to be interacting with. And needless to say that uh, these groups are going to be a combination of uh, regular staff members as well as volunteers. So uh, until the time leadership is fully uh, clear about uh, the capabilities of uh, the teams they are going to form or sub teams that are going to work under the major teams, um, the exercise cannot be extremely successful and effective. Another thing the leadership uh, should ask itself is the history of donations. Who are the donors uh, who have been donating in a big way and who are the ones who have been donating off and on? With these uh, the records, the leadership can uh, come up with uh, an effective program as to how much attention to be given to which segment. So once this is decided, the teams can be sent uh, to uh, collect donations. And once they start working on solicitation, like I pointed out earlier, they've got to be fully trained for that particular exercise because they've got to be very customer-centered. And at the same time, they also have to talk about the benefits which donors are going to derive out of the donations that they give. There are the donors who like to say that they would not like to have anything in return when they make donations. But the fact is that they still have uh, a sense of uh, self-esteem and uh, they do feel kind of uh, big and important by making donations because they know they are privileged. So uh, having uh, a pretty good knowledge of uh, different segments of donors and uh, an equally good uh, understanding of uh, the teams at uh, their disposal, the leaders responsible for this exercise uh, to put together campaign planning and uh, to make um, a fundraising a successful exercise. Now, needless to say that uh, this is a very systematic exercise which uh, is uh, time-framed. So in other words, um, it, it can happen uh, during any time of the year, but uh, it has been the ritual and it still is to have uh, the fundraising campaigns in place um, either once a year or twice a year or maybe more than two times a year. So depending on the kind of cause an organization is working for and the kind of donors the organization is in touch with, the uh, campaign planning is put in place. But uh, the fact remains that uh, the organizers have to be very clear about um, a systematic promotional calendar that they must prepare by keeping uh, in mind total the budgetary uh, requirements that are so that the marketing exercise is executed in as professional a way as possible. This uh, takes us uh, toward budget making 
And I think we are all very clear about one fact that uh, the budgets have to be put together very um, astutely. And uh, any amount of funding that uh, has to be generated through donations, it has to be talked about uh, in meetings prior to uh, such uh, planning uh, processes. Uh, because uh, in uh, the meetings that are uh, held uh, for this particular purpose, organizations tend to talk uh, in a threadbare manner, or rather should talk in a threadbare manner about their funding requirements. And again, needless to say that um, the directors of the board of any nonprofit organization can have to be taken into confidence because they are the people who are in the forefront of helping organizations generate such funds. So here you see that I can add that the volunteers who work for donations and who work in collaboration with um, regular staff members can work or may work at uh, different levels of uh, the fundraising. The volunteers could, could be as uh, high as the uh, members of the board and uh, they can uh, be uh, at a level where they are uh, just uh, helping the organization with its transportation needs. Uh, for example, uh, helping uh, distribute uh, food to needy neighborhoods and uh, doing this kind of a job once in a while in a, in a week is something that may fall uh, within the um, kind of jobs that uh, volunteers do. Uh, I'm going to talk about distribution of such jobs in a short while, but uh, my point here is that uh, the volunteers are not supposed to be working at just the one particular level of the organization or for that matter, the uh, fundraising uh, campaign. They may work at took the different levels and the leadership within the organization uh, responsible for putting together these campaigns has to be the one that is in continual contact with the, the board of directors. And uh, there may be a possibility of uh, one of the uh, directors of the board taking charge of uh, this kind of a campaign in case the nonprofit look it happens to be a small one uh, not having either a very effective chief executive or for that matter a marketing manager and that is why could you tend to uh, pick uh, members of your board with who really can help you from different standpoints of for the, the project or projects that the organization undertake or may undertake in future. You have people who are great entrepreneurs, the people who are from different foundations and people who are community leaders, having extensive contacts and making things easy for the organizations to put together their campaign planning and helping them go through the execution process in a fruitful manner. After we have understood that it requires great leadership for any organization to uh, execute their uh, the campaign planning. We, we've got to take stock of the next important thing, which is goals. And I think this goes without saying that uh, any uh, campaign manager would like to keep in a very close uh, sight the financial goals they have to achieve. Uh, Financial goals could basically are a translation from different kinds of strategic objectives that we've had in place already. And once we have translated what really is it that we need to generate in terms of funding, we go ahead with the execution of the program. I mean, the donation solicitation program, so to say. And the people are on their way to solicit um, funding um, through different uh, ways and means about which I'm gonna talk in a little while as part of the experiential level about which of course we are uh, knowledgeable but nevertheless, in order to talk about the whole concept in a structured way, I have to build uh, different blocks of the knowledge that we have uh, created so far and are familiar with. So once we have the golden goals in place, we have to look at the hard business fact of how to uh, fulfill these goals. And uh, of course, uh, we have to look at the 
history of the organization in terms of uh, the goals the organization has been uh, fixing itself over the last few years. And then we also need to look at the level of success that we've had with the achievement of goals that we've been having in the past. In that particular light, if history is any guide, which it really is, we look at any the possible adjustments that we have to make in order to have a very clear-cut, explicit goals which are attainable. Of course, we're not going to have goals which could not be fulfilled and which pose huge challenges which are unrealistic. The challenges have got to be realistic so that uh, the teams responsible for solicitation and then collection of funds do not return home empty-handed. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, the people are going to have success by 100%. All I'm saying is that uh, goals have to be very realistic for uh, our fund generating teams uh, to be successful uh, by an optimal degree of whether they're working. Another important thing about goal fixing is if an organization has just made its debut, how does it operate? And how does it fix the goals? How does it get to know kind of people, i.e. the donors it has to get into contact with? Well, for that particular purpose, the organization has to go back to the phase it identified the problem and started off with a structured program. So in other words, the uh, people uh, who uh, started the organization uh, are the ones who are very clear about the cause and therefore they certainly have been in contact with all those people who really mattered and still matter for the program uh, to uh, be successful. And therefore, uh, all the stakeholders within the community, the members of the board and uh, all those uh, primary initial donors who uh, can help the founders of the organization with the um, with the first brick, so to say, which they are put in place to get the organization off the ground, should be the ones the organization should contact. And once they do that, that sets the ball rolling for the further connections and further links to be established. Because you are in touch with initial primary donors and they are the ones who can form so many different leads for the new organization to be in touch with the possible donors. In this particular phase, the organization may have to undertake um, efforts that are uh, higher than the normal, but then the fact is they have to carry out this particular uh, exercise in order to pinpoint who the actual donors are. And once they start getting in touch with those donors, they can get into um, the process of um, putting together some good pieces of information in a structured manner about what really motivates different people who are donating toward that particular cause. They had the initial knowledge because there were some primary donors who started with the organization by donating, and now they are in touch with those people who are new, and they are like the new customers for a new organization on the commercial side. Okay, once uh, you start uh, operating on the commercial side, okay, you um, start uh, building up uh, a customer base. And as and when okay, you develop that base, okay, you get to know okay, the different kinds of people falling in different segments of the population that really uh, matter for you and uh, all those segments that happen to be your target market. There may be donors or segments that uh, may donate once in a while and they may be the ones sitting at the margin but that certainly will give you a clear insight into the core segments that you are going to be dealing with in future. Once uh, we have uh, the goals uh, in place, we again go back to the concept of segmentation which happens to be the core concept in this uh, the whole exercise. It is uh, because of uh, the size of uh, the different segments that uh, we are in a position to put together, the amount of effort that we have to put in you know, for approaching those particular segments. 
like I said earlier, we, we may have very small donors who donate once in a while, or they may be the ones who donate frequently or even regularly on a monthly basis as part of their incomes. The income level may be very meager, but still they are the ones who are motivated by the cause given certain reasons. And knowing that we have a good understanding of what really motivates them toward the cause, we approach them. Then we have the donors who happen to be kind of the medium-sized donors, and they are the ones who could be approached by telephones, for example. We carry out telethons for approaching these kinds of donors. Whereas in case of small donors that I talked about earlier, we may go for the direct mail. And for large-sized donors, we get in touch with them personally. It has to be the person-to-person -person contact. And knowing the importance of relationship marketing, we know the, uh, the, the impact personal contacts create. And it is the relationship which matters at the end of the day. And also knowing that in addition to different factors that motivate people toward making donations, there is the, the factor of like, the people-to-people -people donations. So in other words, if like, you happen to be an effective uh, solicitor and like, you are in touch with uh, a large-sized donor in person, like, you have developed a relationship and the relationship has reached a point like, where the donor is fully convinced of your sincerity and your integrity. This relationship is not a social relationship. It is based on a certain rationale, a certain logic, or a certain conviction on part of the um, target audience that um, the solicitor from the organization happens to be a person full of purpose, and whatever he says is absolutely right. The story he tells us about the organization and the benefits he talks about uh, that we get in return for the donation that we make are uh, very appealing and they make donations. And um, in addition to all that, we carry out promotions from time to time. And this is what I pointed out a little earlier by way of talking about the promotional calendars, which can be yearly, bi-yearly, uh, quarterly, depending on the need that you have for the cause to be successful. And it is towards such promotional activities that you put together concerts and the mafilis sama, so to say, and any other activities that you think are a perfect match for the segment of population for which you are putting together that particular promotional exercise. So you have access to the various vehicles at the experiential level, and that's the level at which you get into contact with your target market. And you have a wonderful opportunity of putting together different campaigns to interact with your target market. And when you undertake such activities, it goes without saying, you have a tremendous opportunity of uh, the raising funds which uh, are at a level much higher than those donations that come your way, maybe regularly, uh, but at a level which is rather small or smaller. Another factor that uh, the leadership responsible for campaign planning has to keep in mind is that of uh, the monitoring and record keeping. It may sound uh, rather uh, very administrative, but the fact is that uh, the marketing people have to have a detailed record of uh, who are the ones that have been uh, making donations and uh, to what extent. As a matter of fact, you have a complete record of exact amounts of donations that have come your way uh, from different individuals. And then uh, you can classify those individuals into uh, the small donors and uh, the medium-sized donors and large-sized donors. Uh, but this doesn't end here. The reason uh, I'm really emphasizing on uh, the monitoring and record keeping is that uh, you have an opportunity of uh, the putting together uh, the not just uh, the actual uh, the figures 
that have come your way, but you also can attach with those figures, with all those uh, um, qualitative factors that uh, came to the surface the by way of carrying out some kind of marketing research, whether a formal research or an informal research, whereby you know what really motivates different individuals who donate toward the cause. And this is, from that standpoint, is an extremely important step and a factor that have to be kept in mind. As a matter of fact, it is not just a record about uh, the people who donate, the, but we also got to have to keep a complete record of all those who drop out of the cause. So in other words, it is keeping a record of a continuation got, of all those uh, got, the people who have been donating got, for the last so many years, the, for example, and also at the same time, people who discontinued this particular time got, because they opted not to give. So got, what could be the possible reason? This is got, where uh, the significance of maintaining a very comprehensive record really comes in. Uh, and uh, here again, uh, we have to relate this particular factor uh, with, with what really demotivated such people uh, from making their contribution that they have been making over the past years. Is it that, that now they have started donating uh, towards some other cause uh, which they think is equally noble and um, deserving or is it that the people somehow could have run out of their capability to keep on donating toward the cause, meaning any cause. So whatever the reasons are, those have to be put together as the part of a record which could be dug up during any time of the year by the marketing people in order to fix their future goals in order to put together campaign planning in a much more effective way with all the changes that have taken place internally as well as externally. So continuation of uh, all those donors who are donating toward the cause is like having a record of uh, loyal customers on the commercial side and having uh, a record of uh, the people uh, who have opted out of the cause is equally important because you're not to forget them. It is not that they have opted out forever. They never ever take that for granted because they have a pressing reason to be out of it this time, which means while putting together your campaign for the next time, you will think, how are you going to approach them or whether or not you're going to approach them at all. Whatever the reasons are, whatever the variables are, and the way they present themselves, you uh, put together your planning process. And yet another important factor that uh, we people as uh, the leaders of uh, such camp and planning are gonna have to keep in mind is training of staff. You will recall that I talked about a few factors or other questions that uh, leadership it has to answer itself while they put together planning for a typical campaign because in order to organize the effort and in order to execute the effort, they have to take into consideration so many different things of which training people is extremely important. And when I talk about training, it is not just the training of regular staff members, it also points toward training of the volunteers which I think is even more important than the regular staff members. Uh, the reason is that uh, the volunteers uh, do not always stick with uh, the one uh, particular project. And there uh, may be um, a situation uh, in which uh, some volunteers uh, may leave you, or leave your organization in the middle uh, of the course. And uh, therefore uh, you have to have their replacement and uh, train uh, those uh, newcomers uh, all over again. But the fact remains that we need to carry out a training program. And this takes us back to the area of um, internal marketing. Uh, we keep talking about uh, many of the factors that are external to the marketing process. But if we take a very good look at the strategic process, we know very well that uh, uh, training of people is of utmost importance because they are the human resource. And without the human resource, the concept of um, strategic intent 
and the, the core competencies and so on and so forth uh, go just out the window because then we are talking about things without substance if we do not have the right people to carry out the particular job that we need to carry out. And therefore, uh, the putting together a training program whereby we tell them what really are the goals of the organization and why do we have those goals in place. That what actually has been the history of uh, the level of achievement of goals uh, in the past years. That is extremely important in order to keep your workforce motivated and especially those who happen to be volunteers, not being under any compulsion to work for the organization. They are the people who work because of certain values they harbor very close to them because they think they are working for a noble cause. And all the more reason to keep them motivated lest they get demotivated and stop working for the cause. Now, this is not to say that staff members who are regular are not to be trained they also have to be trained from time to time because nonprofit organizations keep working from project to project. And whenever it is a question of a new campaign, people have got to be given a shot in the arm in order to make sure that they do not lose their vitality and the strength of their professional insight and uh, professional working, especially when it comes to execution. Because don't forget, you're dealing with people who basically are you know, executing the program. And uh, they're not the ones who are planning. Uh, they are responsible for uh, the planning uh, at a very small level, only in terms of uh, the making uh, the programs for visiting certain areas or making telephone calls or uh, mm, distributing some promotional material and so on and so forth. So uh, training um, takes on um, a very uh, important uh, dimension uh, in terms of uh, not just the, uh, the organization, but also in terms of uh, the people or the target audience uh, these staff members are going to get into contact with. You know why? Here, I'm going to talk about another dimension that falls within the ambit of training and hence the segmentation exercise. And the fact is that you may relate this particular concept with any factor all along the strategic process. And that is the ability of these people to talk about not just the organization, but also about the benefit. You know what I'm saying? they have to be trained and prepared to talk about corporate communications from the standpoint of the corporation, meaning the organization, the non-profit organization, not the corporation, I'm sorry for that, from the standpoint of the organization in order to bring to limelight the success stories that the organization that has created in the past or for that matter, why the organization exists and the kind of programs the organization has put together in order to be successful this time as well, just like the organization has been successful in the past. So from that standpoint, these people have got to be fully knowledgeable about all the levels of uh, the experiential uh, the side of uh, the brand raising because you never know at uh, the what point and uh, in which context they may have to talk about uh, all those things or one of those things that the organization uh, put uh, as part of the experiential uh, level and communicate the cause and communicate the cause very effectively. And these people uh, must be uh, fully knowledgeable about that. What I'm saying is just put yourself in a situation in which uh, you are in contact with uh, a donor and donor talks about uh, the certain things that uh, your organization carried out as part of the communication campaign, uh, the meaning as part of the overall experiential level of brand raising. And you not being in the picture or you know, losing track of uh, what the organization has been doing uh, would be very embarrassing for you. And therefore, uh, you've got to have a complete understanding of uh, what the organization has been doing. So here, uh, I'm talking about two different standpoints. Uh, the one is the, uh, the customer-centeredness 
that for which the organization has been working and is working. So you must know who the customer is. You must know what the organization has been doing for that customer. And at the same time, you must also be talking about the donor with whom you're talking because he's the one that who must also know that there are certain benefits to what he's doing. He's paying a cost. And like I said earlier, even if he or she insists that they are not really interested in terms of what they get in return, still you should be very tactful talking about the noble service which these people are doing in order to home in the point that hits the sense of their self-esteem, even if they want it, or don't want it. So uh, the people, uh, the teams that um, approach uh, the different segments should be the one uh, that are very knowledgeable about uh, the, what the organization has been doing about uh, their uh, communication um, strategies. And they should be highly articulate in terms of uh, putting across uh, their uh, point. And the point is twofold. I will summarize once again. The one is the customer centeredness um, or the success stories that the organization they may have to, um, I mean, the organization or the organizations that they may have to share with the target audience. And at the same time, they should also be able to talk about the target audience right here who happen to be donors. And uh, they should talk about things that really uh, appeal to the segment they are interacting with. The last factor I would say is um, recognition of donations by donors. This is uh, something that leaders within nonprofit organizations must not lose sight of because uh, people would like to see always what really has happened to the money that they gave toward a particular cause or an organization. If uh, an organization happens to be a roaring success, they keep hearing about the organization from so many different sources, uh, and uh, they uh, feel confident all the time that uh, their money has been put to the best possible uh, use, and uh, the organization is uh, making progress and strides uh, toward achievement of their uh, core mission. But uh, what uh, if the organization does not uh, really happen to be a very highly visible organization well, they must, in that particular case, talk with their uh, with the donors. The fact is that uh, even if the organization happens to be um, a worldwide uh, uh, organization that everybody knows uh, what the organization is all about, even then they have to communicate with their donors. And they can do that, or rather they do do that uh, with the help of newsletters. Uh, just uh, one example uh, that I will give you. With the help of those newsletters, they talk about uh, all the developments that have taken place over a certain period of time between the previous uh, newsletter and this particular newsletter. So, meaning the communication that is going across right now and the communications predecessor that you talk about. And the developments that have taken place between the two thereby keeping your donors fully confident that the money they gave toward your organization has not gone waste. And the results that you have achieved, you must talk about those one by one in detail with the help of nice graphics by putting together certain photographs and you know the pieces of speeches or testimonials that might have been given by important stakeholders uh, whoever they are, the volunteers, the donors, the staff members, board members, or uh, important politicians, or uh, the important community leaders uh, who might have visited the organization and talked about the achievements of the organization, and uh, uh, then communicating all that uh, to your uh, donors uh, will make a lot of sense to them and give them a sense of satisfaction that their the money really was put to a good cause. There are um, organizations that um, get into things like uh, giveaways. 
and uh, certificates in order to recognize uh, donations from their donors. And uh, certificates are the ones that I did talk about as part of the, I think, experiential level. Um, you uh, give uh, those certificates to people who really feel important uh, about being important part of the society by doing something very positive that has been recognized. And then you have giveaways of different kinds which you distribute among your donors by having things like the t-shirts and the wristbands and you know caps and hats and so on and so forth. Just in order to strengthen awareness of the cause that your organization is working for. This is something which really works in two ways. The one is it creates more awareness, meaning it strengthens awareness and then it transforms the people from awareness into the contemplation stage, thereby bringing in more donors and donors you know, who use the giveaways that you give them with a sense of pride. They do talk about that and people ask them about that. So that in itself is a promotional activity which really multiplies the um, organization's um, efforts uh, toward generating funds. And that is the bottom line. And uh, it also uh, works very well in terms of the behavior model of um, different stages uh, where uh, donors uh, may find themselves if uh, you recall the concept that I talked about earlier. So this, uh, once again, is a building block I'm just referring to uh, for the sake of interest and for the sake of reference. I'm going to talk about a very interesting component of learning, which is about revenue from sales and services. This highlights the importance of the level of revenues that are generated uh, by different nonprofit organizations. And the reason I'm going to talk about this is uh, because we know that we have two different sources of generating funds. The one is from revenues from sales and service, and the other one is donations. And we know that donations come toward organizations from different sources, and the level of donations constitutes something like 20% you know, of the total funding that is required by the organizations. And the fact is that almost 80% is being generated by nonprofit organizations in order to sustain themselves. Now, you will recall that uh, I did quote uh, uh, the one statistical figure uh, in these terms uh, the by giving reference uh, from a study conducted back in 1993 in the US. I do not uh, really have figures uh, in relation to our own society, unfortunately, uh, but the fact remains that the pattern uh, is pretty much the same. And uh, the fact again remains that uh, the nonprofit organizations in most of the cases are generating funds through revenues uh, by selling their core missions. The question is, what really is it that uh, motivates organizations to generate that much uh, by selling their core missions? It is the feeling that funding exercise in terms of generating donations is uh, becoming more and more challenging for the simple reason that uh, the more and more causes are springing up every other day all over the world and uh, the foundations and individuals uh, who donate toward different causes are getting uh, more and more choosy as to who to give and who not to give. So due to this particular competition, organizations have become very sensitive to the fact that they must be in a position to sustain themselves uh, by setting their core missions. And therefore, uh, we can say that they have become very efficient in terms of developing marketing skills to sell their missions. Look at the hospitals, look at different universities, and look at the dispensaries. There are so many different examples where you go and pay. And you may not be paying as much as you pay elsewhere when you walk into a private commercial facility. But the fact remains that such organizations do charge you. We have been talking about things like the cancer hospital or other institutions like that, even within our country, where uh, uh, some very highly specialized treatments are carried out, but then you have to pay. The organizations do have different kinds of pricing strategies in place. They have uh, a target market 
they cater to the needs of for the buyer not charging at all. And then if they have a target market, uh, they really charge and they charge to the extent of at least uh, generating their operating costs. Now, if they are undertaking a premium pricing strategy or not, it is not our knowledge but the fact is that organizations could have different pricing objectives. And as we know very well, they have different pricing strategies in place. And the reason for having such strategies are to generate their own funds. They want to be self-sufficient and they want to be self-contained in the sense that at least a major portion of their costs is recovered by selling their services. Organizations uh, that uh, think that uh, they have to have uh, less and less dependence on donations and are not in a position to sell their core missions, for example, they do not happen to be a hospital uh, or a museum uh, of uh, arts and crafts where they have the opportunity of selling their products, but they think uh, the sales uh, cannot be that much uh, high that they can generate uh, a fairly large amount of their costs. They may get into selling things uh, which are not directly related with their core mission. Making their own existence uh, very challenging. And this is here that uh, the many experts criticize such nonprofit organizations for getting into areas uh, where they do not belong. But then the counter argument from nonprofit organizations is that in order to sustain themselves, they have to do something to add to their revenues. And if they are in a position to lay their hands on items that they can sell uh, without putting in um, uh, some extra efforts, so be it. And uh, they really can add to uh, what um, is generated by the organization itself. And this is the kind of counter argument given by uh, NPOs, but then uh, the fact is it all depends on the ability of the organization to what extent they feel comfortable uh, with uh, undertaking uh, a project with which uh, is quite detached from the court mission. And if the organization is confident enough of uh, adding some revenue to their uh, kitty, I think there may not be something grossly wrong with that. I personally think that way. There is yet another area, or rather approach, whereby nonprofit organizations have started generating revenues. And you'll be amazed to know that they are getting into consultancies of different kinds. As a matter of fact, when I give you examples, you'll be in agreement with me at how interesting the concept could be. A hospital, which happens to be a nonprofit organization and which really has specialized in a certain high-tech areas can be a very good consultant to a commercial hospital of a similar kind because this nonprofit hospital has been through the mill and they have gathered a lot of expertise and the experiential uh, cash that they have, uh, they can share that with uh, a commercial entity that is uh, they're planning to come up. And as long as uh, this commercial hospital is going to serve um, a huge portion of the population, it doesn't really matter for the nonprofit organization if they sell their expertise because they make things easy for that commercial entity. And the same could be the case for an educational institution that happens to be primarily nonprofit but can be a good consultant to a commercial enterprise, meaning a commercial college or university that requires the kind of expertise the nonprofit educational institution already has acquired. Here, again, there are critics and they are very vocal because they say this is something which really drifts the nonprofit organizations from their core mission. And this is a breach of the public trust. They go as far as that in leveling the allegation on nonprofit organizations that try to be consultants by selling their expertise generated through execution of their noble cause. But then again, nonprofit organizations could have their argument and it remains the same. The argument is instead of putting in efforts to generate funds from donations, if we can make this particular approach the one significant area of generating revenues, what is wrong with 
doing that as long as we do not dilute the core mission of our own organization. And it is a matter of how you look at it. It's a matter of perspectives, you know. The nonprofit organization has the perspective that um, the target audience that they are um, uh, dealing with, meaning their client base, that is not going to be affected by this uh, particular organization. And therefore, whatever they do uh, as uh, an activity uh, related to the commercial side uh, does not affect the noble cause and their execution of that particular cause, it should not be considered as uh, a mission creep or a mission drift. It again is a the matter of uh, the perspectives. There, there may not be a fully right answer or a totally wrong answer, but again, the fact is the organization has to uh, see for itself what really is it that uh, is a good cause and uh, to what extent it is doing um, an absolutely great service. It is not diluting the purpose for which it really exists, the meaning it really uh, is holding up the reason for its being. And it may also consider to what extent it is uh, getting commercial uh, by getting into selling its services. But as long as um, they put all that money uh, for further investments into the further programs, it remains a matter of debate.